Planet Radio at OffPlanetRadio.com. I'm Randy Moggins. It's the month of June. It's getting hot. We're kind of in this like weird temporal distortion field right now where a lot of shit's hitting the fan. And uh, our guest tonight actually is an expert at shit hitting the fan, and he's going to explain why it's hitting it, how it's hitting it, and what we can do to deflect the shit. And Emily's here to tell you all about our guests. Hey, Em, how you doing? Good. Hi, everybody. Please excuse the strange background and the, my <laughs> face being half in shadow. I've just moved into a new place and I'm not settled yet. So nothing is ideal, but we will have fun anyway. So let's get to it. Um, so for, the, for many years now, our guest has been using predictive linguistics to forecast emerging global population trends and publishing the results in his very popular Alta reports. He's here tonight to help us sort through the current state of cryptocurrencies, bluebirds, and the deepest of woo. This one is long overdue. From the aptly named half past human, Cliff High, welcome to one of the wooiest podcasts on the net. Welcome to Off Planet Radio. Oh, I'm thrill thrilled to be here. It is long past due. I listen to you guys all the time. Oh my gosh. That's awesome. Uh, with that, uh, just, uh, that, that's actually refreshing and unnerving at the same time because I think we're kind of a mutual admiration society from a distance then. Yeah. I've been reading your reports off and on for years and watching what you're doing as well. Well, and uh, it, you know, I couldn't help it, guys. I mean, you've got a really good, um, solid presence there and the. Um, uh, the grasp of the language and stuff, the nuances that the two of you guys pull out of your guests. I mean, really, really quality. Uh, Bajiago, wow. you know, I love that. That was a good one. Thank you. Wow. Yeah. That's super cool. Excellent. Well, so let's, uh, <laughs> should we get right to it or, <laughs> or should we stroke each other's egos a little more? <laughs> no, 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 no. No, uh, no you can call I, me a I, bastard now and we'll get right to it. <laughs> absolutely not. No, absolutely I, not. Yeah. Um, I like I said going into this, and it is it is kind of we're kind of in this weird season right now. It feels like I, I'll give you an example of exactly what this feels like for me right now, Cliff. I got up from a nap in the late afternoon and looked out my window, and I went, "That sky is wrong. Everything about the entire vista around me felt wrong from a light standpoint." And in that moment when you're in half dream state, you tend to like reflexively let go of your initial instincts and just kind of unwind with it. And I was like, something's moved, something's shifted, something's changed. And that's the sense that I get of the time that we're in right now. It's turbulent, it's dramatic. There's a lot of things that feel off kilter. And at the same time, it feels like we're trending, trying to trend towards equilibrium. How does that fit into what you're seeing in the reports and, and in your own view of things? Well, see, you're like a prototypical example of the kind of fellow that I would want to snatch the language from uh, because you're temporally aware. Now, you're actually not the kind of guy I'd like to do it because you're conscious of that awareness. So you really want to find the fellows that are unconscious and they just let it leak out, right? Yeah. And so there's no conscious filter. However, I really respect the fact that you're tuned into yourself enough to notice your own uh, sense of um, uh, uh, temporal waviness, okay? <laughs> the ability to, to uh, sense the nuance of time. Uh, this is the kind of thing that you find a lot of the uh, great writers, uh, you know, um, cat on a hot uh, tin roof guy. Yeah. Tennessee. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, Tennessee Williams, Williams, right. He was always yeah. after that nuance of temporal feeling, right? Yes. And yes. You, you would also see that from the West Coast writers in the 30s and 40s. Kurt Vonnegut Jr. was another one that kind of channeled that gestalt. Okay, now well. he, was the, yeah. he was the end of that trail that I'm talking about, mm -hmm. though. Because what I want to say is that you're quite right. Something has changed. A lot of things have changed, and you're picking up on them. 
And what's actually going on is the is a sort of an echo of what happened in the 30s and the 40s. It is the weirdest tempo, temporal echo that I've ever even thought I could possibly describe because it shouldn't exist for any rhyme or reason, yet it's here. And we find ourselves uh, suffering a lot of the same kind of events with slightly different characters and slightly different nuances to what occurred in the 30s and 40s. We're going through the same kind of uh, economic trash that we had then. We've got the rise of uh, cult kind of figures that are so popular that that we're reaching into the same kind of thing that occurred then uh, people were looking for answers then the way same way they're looking for him now there was a temporal difference that was going on that a lot of writers attempted to try and put into words and pass on to future generations and then we hit into the 40s and 50s and it went away from the 50s through the 60s, there was none of this temporal awareness. The, the writers of the time were white glitz. They were there. All of the movies and everything were, were all the, the um, prima facie, what we see here now. It was now slice of life up. kind of stuff. It was Correct. very much, yeah. So, so you notice the time has actually altered how, in terms of how we feel. Now, right. I've, I've, I'm a, a real fan of a couple of people in terms of writers. One of them is Buckminster Fuller, and the other yeah. is this guy, Cozy Rev, okay? Cozy yes. Rev is, is like the, the Russian version of Buckminster Fuller, only instead of getting success, he was shoved into a gulag and isolated right. for most of his yeah. professional life. But the work he did when he came out was all about time. And not just about time, uh, but also about humans being temporal antennae, if you will, and also being able to broadcast something that he tried to elucidate and to illuminate that actually can affect time. And he did all of these experiments that he proved that could be repeated over and over and over and over again by people with just the crudest kind of little little circumstances. You can prove to yourself that you can actually alter time. Right there in, in real time, so to speak, you're altering the, the perception of uh, time as it is experienced by an object or by a, another chunk of life. So, so there you go, Guy. So what you're experiencing now is our segue into this new time is th- that I've been harping about for years that's being directed by these unknown energies from space. Uh, and they're slipping around the sun now because the sun's corona, its plasma, is shrunk. It's shrinking from 5,000 degrees Kelvin down to about 3,000. As it does so, all these energies slip around the sun and they're coming down and bombarding us. They've actually stripped off the top of our atmosphere in 2000. Uh, in three, they took the top 15%. Uh, They reduced our oxygen volume on the planet significantly. We're going to have to stop running cars, not for the reason that the uh, global warmists say, but because we we can't afford the oxygen consumption that's going to occur, that, that is occurring with every car. For every minute that they're sitting there idle, it is the equivalent of 800 humans uh, breathing along with you. You use up that much oxygen for every car we've got. So, uh, it's impacting the, the oxygen component of our, of our atmosphere. And so when I was a kid in the 50s, we were looking at um, 21% oxygen. And you go to, the, to some places, like in the ocean beaches, where you have these um, oxygen-rich environments, and you might be running 23 and 24%. And now those oxygen-rich environments are down to 17 and falling. So, uh, so the, <laughs> indeed, things are changing all around us. Your perception of light, of course, is triggered by the density of the, the atmosphere and how much oxygen and the other components in it. So, so you're, you're, being, you're picking up on all of these clues. Your eyes, your subsystem of your eyes are telling the temporal part of your brain, hey, some weird shit's going on. <laughs> Pay attention. And, and uh, you're picking it up, but so few people do. I actually think a lot of people are picking it up and they're, they've been really, really releasing it in the language, and they're not yet aware of what's going on. And this is that, that jittery feeling that they've got. Uh, it, and it's evident everywhere. And you see, you know, touchiness uh, in the sense of um, uh, don't actually, don't touch me, you know, don't be close to me. I'm, I'm, right. I'm, you know, explosive almost. And you just see it in people everywhere. And now, of course, the wars are starting up and so on, just as it did in the 30s. So, there's no um, physical reason, and so far as the uh, only people who are doing the work, the Russians, are, are plotting the course of the sun through space, okay? Our science is so benighted, all we care about is how we trail behind that sun. So we're, we're concerned with the orbit of planets, not the orbit of the, the thing we're all following, the sun. 
The Russians have a team that's dedicated to that. And insofar as they've discovered, there's no reason for us to assume that we're passing through the same um, place in or same density of, of um, material that we did in the 30s. But a logical explanation, which there, there, there is out there, but no one's really backing it yet, is that in the 30s, we entered some kind of, um, uh, it could be thought of as a trough. And, and so we, we're skimming, we're, our sun is pulling us across to some kind of an energy density trough. And in the 30s and 40s, we hit that one side of it, yeah. the energy changed, and now we're hitting the other side. Only all of us guys have lived in that trough all of our lives. And so we think that's normal. But really, the, the energies we're getting now yeah. is going to be the persistent energies for perhaps 60, 70,000 years. Wow. So our normal was predicated on this very narrow window of time, the 1930s through what will we now. say now. Yeah. But wow. we're going through what would be called a rather spectacular change. It's actually turbulence. This is like you talk about a yeah. trough and I'm thinking waves and I'm thinking what happens when you take a boat and you ride it up over a crest and you drop back down again. Oh, yeah. There's, you know, you, 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 you sail boats. That's oh, yeah, yeah, exactly yeah. what it feels yeah, It's right like. in the pit of your stomach. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's wonderful. Um, yeah. If you don't throw, if you're not vomiting, it's, it's marvelous. <laughs> rush. Well, and also if you're aware of it, you know, Yeah. I have a question. Is that, yeah. that trough that we've been in from the 30s to, to now, um, that's also the same period of time where such a significant amount of control has been placed upon human beings. Does something about the energetics of that trough, did the people who are the bastards that are doing this understand that those energies in that space would allow for the kinds of things they've been doing? And now, even though this feels turbulent as we're coming out of it, the, the, what we're going to be going into will not be energies that are so conducive to their level of control. It's a very astute observation. It's 100% correct. The degree to which um, they uh, are aware of, of the time period that they're in uh, at a conscious level, I can't comment on, but we can certainly uh, find evidence that, there, that the level of manipulation was deliberately ramped up in the 20s, actually through about um, the late teens, uh, you know, 1910 onward. Yeah. A and uh, so it, it makes a lot of sense. They knew it was coming. And one could make a um, supposition from some stuff that came out in the 1830s that there was group that there were groups that that went through a, an experience in the 30s, uh, in the 1830s, uh, there was like let's say a uh, a premature wave that we hit, yeah. uh, just a little bit of it, and it and it gave blossom to all kinds of things uh, around the planet, including the utopian wave in the United States with all these utopian communities, the you know the Shakers, the the uh, Onita groups, all of these kind of people, right, and and uh, they. So, so there was that sort of thing that was replicated again in the 30s, and now we see it again. So there, we can ask a couple of questions about this. Are these so related that we will then go through another 100 years and hit an even bigger wave that replicates what we're going through now, right? So if so, then right now we're looking at the creation of the cryptocurrencies, and what they are uh, representing is a financial layer that in the 1930s was, was filled in by the insurance companies. It was when insurance companies and all of that financial layer basically came into existence. And so we're replicating that same energy, that same emotional tone with cryptocurrencies. So maybe if anybody's alive here among us 100 years from now, then we will see if we have the mother of all crashes as something happens to the cryptos at a giant depression level in, in, the, in that period. But I suspect for sure that the uh, boundary layer that we crossed in 1930, which we know was, had some of the same energies as the 1830s, but was uh, distinctly different, we're, we're coming into the same uh, boundary layer, but from the other side. So it is as though yeah. we were looking at a mirror held up uh, for a passage. And so we're going to re re reflect all of that. And when we come out, it'll be that different world all over again. Wow. Now, I don't know what the hell is going on with the Mandela effect, the quantum computers impacting that, uh, the ability of these people to start monkeying about with time and CERN all go to your point that they know right. and that they're and also that they're desperate to haul us all back yeah. into into their level of control. Uh, the the thing, the element 
uh, that may make these levels of time different may have to do uh, with uh, cognitive ability in some way, all right? Now, we could speculate as to the different types uh, of cognitive ability that we might be finding ourselves running into in the future that would make it less likely they could control us. So we could speculate that, okay, we're going to have, uh, let's just call it a, uh, uh, an awareness uh, spread uh, throughout humans to where they'll stop uh, looking at their phone and look up around and, and examine themselves and this kind of a thing, right? We can hope that that's going to be the case because if we look into the 1930s and stuff, there was that kind of um, uh, period, like before 1910, uh, the standard um, New York Times kind of uh, a public comment uh, section would be paragraph after paragraph of very well thought out, well structured arguments on, um, you know, uh, national monetary policy as opposed to, you know, um, uh, the latest celebrities wig, that kind of a deal that we're getting now. So I suspect that indeed there's been some kind of uh, mental thing that's going on. You mean uh, Kim Kardashian's ass, basically? Correct. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Exactly. But that's yes. interesting. In that, in that period, we saw the establishment of the Federal Reserve System, the beginning, the rise of the fiat banking system. Whereas, this is where we come into the crux of a very important issue to discuss with you. Because what we now see, having gone through the tech era, and all that that heralded in terms of the great promises of technology itself obviously began with the whole earth catalog for God's sake. I mean, it was Stuart Brand. It was the people like that who were the rebels in the 1960s that were basically pushing the, the personal computer movement forward. And I'm using that largely as the, the icon of, of the technological era. We had computers before that. We, in fact, had pretty sophisticated computers before that. As far as the public's concerned, the beginning of the era of the personal computer was a liberating concept of technology based on empowering communication on an individual level. And so we've gone through late 70s, 80s, 90s. We got to the 2000s. We had the internet. The internet has taken us and foisted us onto this platform of interconnectedness. And now we're at the place where we're addressing once again this issue of how we transact business with each other on a layer that says we need to decouple from central banking. We need to find secure ways to transact business between individuals, businesses, corporations, da, 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 da. And in the mix of all this, we now see the rise of blockchain, Bitcoin, Ethereum, probably a dozen other of these currencies that some of which I'm just starting to learn about as well. So the There's question now- uh, that's what I'm given to understand. Yeah. yeah. So in all of this, we're now staring at something that the average person does not understand. I'm not even sure I understand it, which is why, you know, we really wanted to have this conversation because I'm a bit puzzled by the concept of Bitcoin specifically and blockchain technology in general as to how safe it is how secure are we in it and how much of it is now at the point we're at right now speculation versus building something that's a solid basis for value storage sure this is this is you're talking to somebody right at the tech level that, that yes. i live at right yeah okay so i've been given the same kind of um uh, uh encapsulated understanding to a number of people recently as the cryptos have exploded so let's examine the idea of a blockchain. Blockchain is simply a bunch of, of um, lines of text that are sent uh, through the same cable that connects you to the web. The same cable that's allowing the video to go through at a different frequency has a, is gonna have a different protocol. The internet, the web page you see, the graphics, all of that is delivered to your computer on a protocol, protocol called hypertext markup language, right. HTML. Okay, that was invented in the 90s. It was invented at CERN of all places. And let's go back to Stuart Brand, by the way. Let's not forget that, okay? 
Right. Um, but anyway, so the blockchain is, is basically a group of com computer statements that are tied to each other in distinct segments, and they have little numbers that tie, each other, tie them together. So they are a block of code, right? And this block says uh, we've got these uh, nine lines of code. We're just making up a number. It doesn't matter. It's, a, it's a, of a specific size. And it rides on that particular layer that we'll call uh, the Bitcoin protocol. And the bit, because we'll just talk about Bitcoin at the moment since it was the first most popular one. Uh, this is simply, uh, this Bitcoin protocol is like HTML. It's a uh, instruction that you just throw out onto the internet. Basically, you put it on a server and some other server comes and requests it and passes it to a client, which is your, your PC. And in this case, what, what they're doing before they pass it to you is that they're the computer, uh, the, the server, the node, they call it, is actually reading each and every one of the lines that it's passing to you. So it's kind of like the machine interrupts your email to read it to make sure you're not getting garbage and it puts it into the spam, right? Mm -hmm. Or that whatever, for whatever reason, whatever filters you set, the machine actually has to stop and examine what you've got and decide, okay, uh, this meets the criteria or it does not. And that's what this, the, the blockchain is done, doing. Now, the genius of the blockchain has to do with our favorite subject, time. Okay, the blockchain cannot exist without time. What happens is that they all sync up, all the computers on the planet that are on the internet are all synced up to atomic time, where we all agree that there's this one long number and that's this millisecond. And then there's another number that's incremented by one and that's the next millisecond. And so once they're all doing that, once all the computers are understanding the same time, then they stamp the block. They said, oh, I got this block at this time. It's mine, it's my block. And then I'm gonna read it real fast and then I'm gonna stamp it again and then I'm gonna put it back out on the internet. And if it does this fast enough, because all of these nodes are trying to process that same little block of code, then it gets the reward. And so it is a miner. And as a miner, what it does is it reads that code and it makes some calculations based on it. Now, this code that it's reading is an encapsulated version of our collective ledger, our collective account, who owes who, how much, who spent uh, what on who uh, for how much and this kind of thing. That ledger still is recorded a uh, transaction I made back in uh, 2011 or so, right? <laughs> it cost me, right, right, yeah, yeah. cost me like a, a total of 18 Bitcoin to buy socks for Christmas presents that year. Wow. You know, imagine the cost of those socks now. Ouch. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> though, but, that, but the point is that that, that ledger, is, that, that entry is still out there. Uh, it's still recorded in this public ledger, still being processed by these nodes, still being maintained all around the planet, so that if I ever needed to recover it, I can. It's instantly available. Now, the beauty of it is, it, it is identified by a string of numbers that only I can get at, my private key, and that's what keeps me secure. And so as long as I don't share this string of numbers with people, nobody can read my records on the public, public ledger. So it's, it's true, it's sort of anonymous, right? You can actually track public keys and you can make certain assumptions. And if someone shows you a public key that says, hey, send me a donation here, you could sort of track how much uh, money or Bitcoins go in there. But mm -hmm. basically, basically it's an anonymous system that's a secure ledger. So it's like we're all keeping track of everybody's um, uh, credit card expenditures and so that nobody can overspend uh, the amount of Bitcoin they have. Now, the beauty of the cryptocurrencies arising at this time is twofold. Uh, it's trustless. We don't have to trust each other because we've got the, the blockchain that we can trust because it's being processed by all of these nodes, by the rest of the planet. So without that, that issue of trust, you can do business with someone and know that your, your um, uh, transactions and everything will be uh, above board and, and straightforward. The problems that we run into with um, uh, some kinds of transactions are eliminated. It, and it can also be very speedy once we get over this particular hump with the cryptocurrencies. Now, the second aspect of this in terms of the cryptocurrencies arising at this particular point is they cannot be manipulated. Because of the way in which they arose, uh, it wasn't really possible for the people that are, were controlling us from the 30s through now to be able to preload the system, so to speak, to give themselves the upper hand. Uh, this was truly a breaking out of technology when Universe decided that we all needed the help. And in helping us, uh, it's provided us a, a free market that is responding to emotional reactions in a way that our manipulated markets haven't for the last 40 or 50 years. Thus, 
those people that have uh, followed me and know for a fact that I'm the world's worst silver price forecaster have to acknowledge <laughs> that my system actually really does work when we have an unfettered market and I can get at those emotions because I've been spot on on some really amazing um, uh, uh, ability to predict price movements within these because I can get at the emotions because it's not a uh, controlled market. And so uh, uh, the cryptocurrency is showing up now. It's a very liberating force. There's two things that most people don't recognize when they look at this. They see, you know, the, they're blinded by the greed, the avarice, uh, the fear of not getting in, all of this kind of thing. Or they're saying, uh -huh, I want to stay away from it. But a lot of people don't recognize that this truly is the global monetary reset happening right in front of our face. And that our our experiment here with cryptocurrencies is the next evolution of humanity's understanding of what money means. Okay, so money in the past was something that was had to be a store of value that you took along with the exchange. Here we're in the process of abstracting that even further, separating out store of value from exchange, and then piling on dynamic uh, capability to exchange. And so it's truly starting to uh, interact and create whole new ways of, of doing business eliminating costs and making things hugely price performing at a time when we're really going to need it because we're running into an energy wall relative to the uh, strange energies from space, the ice age and all these other problems that are hitting us. We need to be very efficient as a species. So we can't afford a lot of waste anymore. And the, and the cryptocurrencies are going to get rid of all of that. Now they're also software. So right. people have to understand that, right? Yeah. And so it's computers that are processing little chunks of, of money that is in fact just a digit, just a numeric representation. There's all kinds of nuances within the um, cryptocurrency space. Uh, I've been able to transfer over some of my technology to filter through all of the uh, rising amount of verbiage that's bubbling up with all of these crypto releases and filter out some of the good ones and to filter out some of the bad ones as well. So to just tell people to avoid this kind of an idea and, and these sorts of things, if you're going to be speculating, but we're at a point now where, because but there just, is no, okay. And you just hit ahead. that word. You just hit that word speculating. And this, yeah, this really to me is kind of, maybe it's my aversions to risk. I have looked at, I've looked at Bitcoin and I've watched it rise and I've watched it. And oh my God, what is it right now? It's over $3,000 today somewhere i saw that but right now we're i posted something the other day on facebook this may seem rather inflammatory but it was just one of those just saying guys people remember the tulip bulb thing that happened in the 1840s with the speculation that went with tulip bulbs and how that exploded. And then all of a sudden the bottom dropped out of the market and a bunch of people lost a shitload of money. Some of them lost <laughs> homes and you know, they, sure. they gave, oh, yeah. it was like the stock market. They spent money they didn't have on speculation. Mm -hmm. And it was a cautionary, but I read a lot of notes to myself in public. And for me, it was just kind of this, how much do we really know about where Bitcoin is going right now and why it's going there. And I approach it this way. This is a currency that's based on clock cycles inside of a computer, as you've explained. There really is not any form of intrinsic value or utilitarian value in the current currency itself. Now we talk no, about you're wrong. And gold. You're wrong. Okay. You're wrong. Prove me wrong. Great. Okay. So here's Good. the thing. It's because Bitcoin is not a currency or because it is a true currency. Okay. okay. Gold is a monetary store. Gold cannot be a currency in, in, our, modern, in our modern world. Uh, I don't know where you are physically, but I'm not able to transfer gold to you now. I'm not even able to do it electronically. The powers that be say that that's not allowed. I would have to go through the rigmarole of getting uh, something shipped to you. And I'd have to go through insurance and all of this. Bitcoin eliminates all of that, okay? As a cryptocurrency, its intrinsic value is the encryption on our exchange, yeah. all right? In a world right now crammed okay. full of people, what is the primary thing every human needs? Privacy. And why is this? Because as, as a human being, our bodies are designed to deal with 145 people in our lives. Period. In our lifetime, 145 people. Whenever tribes got to the point where there were more than 145 people, more or less, they had to split up. They'd split up into two sections and you'd go off and then you'd build up to another 145. 
So humans are in, incredibly impressed by the sheer number of other humans and all the transactions we have to deal with them and so on. All the people you have to remember, all of the, the social media that you're being inundated with, all the faces, mm -hmm. all of the mm -hmm. computers yeah, and so on. Absolutely. Okay, this removes privacy from your mind totally. Okay, and one of the things we really need these days is privacy in our individual transactions because of big evil uh, masses of people that have gotten together, hover around one or two psychopaths, gather all the sociopaths to them yeah. and say, we're in charge. Yeah. Okay, we got to watch our ass for these people. Uh, so cryptocurrencies inherent value is the hash. This algorithmic construct that provides a number based around what you put in as text, basically. And that number can't be cracked to retrieve your text unless you have one, one other number. And so you have privacy. And then there's coins that have taken this one and two and three and four levels beyond that. And so we're now breaking free of the control structure at a grassroots level. And because it is software, and because it is, it's, it's weird ass programmers like myself, and script kitties, you know, I mean, uh, you may not know them, Randy. Emily, oh, no, I'm I sure do. I've been in, okay. I've worked around the tech industry for 20 years. I know, you I'm know. not a coder, but I've written, I write database. I mean, sure. I know, I know SQL code, I know basic, I know... There yeah, you go then. I understand it. So. These kids, these can't, these kids can't be stopped. Once the idea is out there, there you go, right? Yeah. And so uh, blockchain can exist whether they try and suppress it or not. And in mm -hmm. fact, the more it would try to be suppressed, the more it's going to blossom because we need it now, because our currency is dying. So you were talking about aversion to risk, all right? And the shooting up of it, the speculation. All right, mm -hmm. there is speculation now, but speculation has nothing to do with economics. Speculation is an emotional condition. It entirely describes emotion. Most people think yeah. it has something to do with money, and it doesn't. You can speculate with anything and get that same emotional high. It's dopamine going through your brain at a particular level that triggers certain kinds of, right. of conditions, right. okay? Yeah. And so it's the same thing that um, gamblers get, that, that sort of a deal, or archers. Archers will get that same bit of speculation the moment they release. So, uh, so uh, what we're actually running into is an emotional condition that I think is coming as a result, and it's coming out so hard as a result of the 40 plus years we've been held in bondage to the current financial system. Actually going back to 1972, and then you can make the argument it actually existed prior to that, right? Yeah. We've been in bondage for that long. So as slaves, as being, having the secret space program and all these people strip our lives of wealth, that we were out there sweating and, and, you know, and they're stripping this stuff away from us secretly. And so universe said, Hey people, I like you. I, you know, humans are still around after all the shit I've thrown at you for all these millennia. And, mm -hmm. and don't buy the idea, by the way, that humans have only been on this planet a few hundred thousand years, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, so we'll back yeah, out on that no. idea. But the no. universe said, here's my bone for you. You know, if you're willing to chew on this, it's a way out. And there's a lot of us that saw this and said, that's a good bone. Let me get on. Yeah. So the way you just described that, when you were describing it, it's an actual currency, whereas metals are a, as, as, a, as a store. That actually made sense to me in a way that actually shifts some of my thinking about this. I guess for me, like my question has always been, you know, um, my, my intuition, I think, was to like go along with like Chris Twain's line of thought that if you don't hold it, you don't own it. Right. Um, and same exist here, though. Hold right. your private keys. You got them in yeah. your hand. Right. Yeah. I guess I was thinking, you know, I was thinking of it as something I guess my, I, I always feel like what happens if for some reason we don't have the Internet or we don't have it in the way that we have it? What happens to all those bitcoins you have? But I guess for some reason, the way you just described it, they'll never even though they like to threaten us with taking away the internet, that would take away their ability to spy and keep track of us. So they're not going to do that. And so right. it's not, it's actually the safest place to sort of do our stuff. Yeah. It makes Correct. really good sense. And they, they're yeah. putting so much energy into the internet. You wouldn't believe. Okay. I yeah. grew up in the telephony industry as, as us old guys say, I came up out of the telephone industry. Right. And so I was there when SS seven uh, signal switching seven was invented and uh, patented and all of that. I participated in that code base. This is the stuff that causes what we call the billing and rating channel to exist. This was the digital signal that allowed our current telephone system. And, and uh, its existence has, has been pumped by the powers that be so much that you know they've got a huge amount invested in it. And actually it has, it has less to do with their spying on us and all of that than their own money issues, their own greed and so forth. They use the internet 
uh, to transfer money right, secretly right. Yeah. And, and to cover up all their crimes, do their bribes secretly, all of right. this kind of stuff, right? When in the old days, when you could tour back in, uh, and I won't reveal any names or anything, or even my own at the time, but you get into some of these places in the dark web, uh, like even before Silk Road, right? And and they were making contracts, and the the contracts were being let with what we have to assume, what I have to assume, because of the language involved, was a federal government employee. So you know, just because they there's there's Fed speak and there's you know subcontractor speak, and you get used to these language patterns. Yes. So they want cryptos to exist. So you're really safe with these and hold the private keys private. Don't keep anything on the exchanges. Uh, you know, uh, so if you want to use an exchange to buy or trade, buy, or, buy your, your coin and then send it to your private wallet. Put that on your PC, put it on your phone, print out those little tiny numbers and you're good. You can actually just type those numbers in and recreate the wallet when you need to. You could memorize those numbers, <clears throat> eat, the, eat the sheet of paper, go across the border, turn around and say, fuck you guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. So all of this is predicated on a stable base of technology, a stable base of energy and a stable power grid and mm. telecom nope, nope. structure. <laughs> no, nope. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. sorry to, Come on. Okay. Yeah. Look. All right. Here's the thing. Internet grew out of, out of DARPA research, which pre right. was predicated on the idea of okay. instability. Okay. And their idea was you got to survive the nuclear explosion, so we need to have right. redundancy everywhere. Well, it, it turns out that when the strategists started actually looking at what was going on, the, all of the power companies were practicing that anyway. We don't have a national power grid. We don't have even power structures from one coast to the other. You've got frequencies that vary by a whole orders of magnitude in transmission lines. That we've got balancing systems running continuously, 24 by 7, just so the thing doesn't fall apart. And, and we've gotten good at that. So no, none of this is predicated on anything being stable. It's actually predicated on the reverse, that you've got people out there 24 by seven, keeping this thing running constantly at the software level, at the hardware level, replacing gear. And, and I used to be one of them. We, we, you know, in the middle of the night, oh, God damn it, what happened? Okay, all right, I'll be down. You know, that kind of thing, right? Yeah, yeah. So what you're telling me then is that we're not in danger of an EMP taking out the entire power grid of the North American continent in any scenario that you understand. That's not true. There is one scenario that would okay. cause that, and that would be a Carrington event uh, right. coming from the sun, but it would take out the whole North American grid, South America, probably. Uh, it would kill so many people that it wouldn't matter. Mm. So, you know, EMP is a- is That's a encouraging. <laughs> well, there's, there's, the, there's the rub. Really, it's, a, right. it's a, a case of, you know, if the internet goes down 100% and they never brought it back up again, yeah, your Bitcoin would be kind of hard to recover, but you're going to have more serious problems than whether or not you've got Bitcoin. Right. And, and okay. nobody else will be able to get their Bitcoin either. So it's not like some people will have it and others won't. It's so won't. It's, a, it's, the great, yeah. it's the great equalizer then. And so, yes, as right. creatures, we're amazingly assured of some comfort in the fact that our fellow man suffers just as much as we do. <laughs> Well, you know, here's the thing, guys. This is what makes us resilient, all right? This is what makes us anti-fragile, is that we suffer all the time, and so we try and solve that suffering. And my suffering might be different than your suffering, and if you're smart, you learn from the thing I did when your suffering re resembles my suffering, yeah. that sort of a thing. And so as long as we have this attitude continuously, I think we're, we are anti-fragile. We're still here after millennia, after huge, giant uh, catastrophes. There was a war on this planet that... <laughs> I hate moving stuff. Um, there was a war on this planet that destroyed a, a uh, Attention band. flat earthers out there. <laughs> okay, no it destroyed a band. Yeah, <laughs> destroyed a band from here all across into this area. Okay, the war destroyed all of that. It destroyed all of uh, the uh, uh, peninsula in here, and it burned all the way back into part of India. That war blazed over such huge amounts of area that we could say that there's a giant uh, mass of green radioactive glass under part of the Sahara that's bigger than the continental United States. So we're still here after that. Yeah. yeah. So, so what was that war? I mean, is that some parallel to what, um, what we're led to believe was in the Velikovsky scenarios, a near flyby of Mars or... No, I, I think a lot of these things are in a misinterpreted. Okay, so we're going to get into some real opinion here. So I have sure. opinions on Hapgood. I have opinions on some of the people that think there have been pole flips. 
and mm -hmm. uh, and um, I think they're wrong. I think that they're simply misinterpreting the evidence that was there, and that we've never had a situation of the poles reversing. There's never been a magnetic flip. It's something we don't have to worry about. Um, and in fact, what we've got is this expando Earth, and it can explain all of the the conditions that that we that creep into us thinking there's been like pole flips. All right, and so the war part of this was actually some kind of a uh, conscious entity to conscious entity war that we find reflected in the war of the gods language and all of, throughout all of the Roman stuff, the Greek stuff, the Vaimani, the wars with the um, Mahabharata, you know, all of this kind of stuff. There's even uh, uh, instances of that war that is reflected uh, all throughout the planet. And so I, I because I'm up in the Pacific Northwest, I've, I'm taken with the local um, native legends about it and these legends I find extend all the way down to the Maori and the Aborigine in Australia. There's a common knowledge base that goes down there, common words and everything. It's even reflected in my crow back here, okay, because their understanding of the war was that the, um, the earth was being dominated by the moon and the raven as the, um, uh, what is it, uh, the expositor of the tale uh was was the one who was the trickster and uh so the raven says uh, basically that changer came and all was made different and we are as we are now because of changer and changer left and then sometime after changer left sky people came and mm. there was war on the earth okay and sky people fought with star people mm. all right now neither of these groups are related to changer changer actually represents the nemo uh which we find uh, examples of these all around the planet in every primitive society these aquatic beings that are that are regarded as being the creators of, of humanity and also they're so regarded as this that the queen and chucky do this little secret ceremony on a sacred rock where they pledge allegiance to their ancient, um, uh, you know, Nummo ancestor, yes. right? Who 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 violated their, the, yeah, I won't go into that <laughs> anyway. Though, but so so, but the the Salish here, the Salish though, and all the other uh, indigenous people here talk about this war and how Earth was thereafter, it, how we were scarred, and how the war was so terrible that the flames of the war could be seen around the planet on the other side of the planet uh, from the war occurring. And how uh, they talk about all the the earth changes that occurred because of the giant war that was going on, how it lasted for uh, there's different variants in here, but about fifty years, and so we're talking things at an atomic level. It was not a flash in the pan kind of a, a war, and how the response was to the to the fire, and so they they speak um, elementally, right? And so right. the the response. Um, to uh, uh, whoever did the fire, I, I forget at the moment whether it was star people or sky people, the response of the other group was ice. And so they destroyed them by freezing them. And so that's why we have Antarctica the way we have it right. now. And so, uh, so you have these legends that are all around there that get into, and it's all intricate in here, but within the symbol here is all kinds of stuff about the earth being um, a, a prison subscribed by the orbit of the moon, how the watchers are on the moon, uh, how the Watchers had done battle with Nemo, how they're afraid of Nemo, uh, Changer, and all of this other stuff in there. The Salish, really, because they were uh, relatively ignored, uh, the, the, all the way up to the Tinglet in Alaska and all the way out into the Maori cultures, we have a much richer, um, much more detailed fabric of humans' experience of what the hell was going on around us as, as all this shit fell down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Very interesting. Well, there's a lot that's there's just so much there that's archetypal that's probably yeah. steeped into our, our our psychology or probably our our DNA. I'm thinking. Oh, more certainly more our DNA. This, certainly, this, yeah. is, this is all genetically kind of yes. programmed in us in our in our emotional or psychological responses as well. Well, look, we have the fight flight or freeze right. syndrome right yeah. all of these things and so these are certainly programmed nobody into ever us. mentions freeze by the way that's yeah. interesting that you mentioned that yeah i'm uh, martial artist i've seen yes. it in action <laughs> yeah sometimes the freezing is the best uh 
the best option. Exactly. Sure. Yeah, like, yeah. Stop, stop doing anything. Yeah, like, I, I often say that when you don't know what to do, sometimes the best thing to do is to not do anything for a minute, just stop. You know right. what I mean? I find that that often leads me to my best solution for whatever the problem is rather than the, doing the something The still react. point. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, get the center and then see what the hell's going on, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But um, no, these things are, are inbuilt to us, you know, uh, were they crafted by a uh, changer when they put us together out of the bits and pieces? I don't know. Has some of it evolved to, uh, since then? I don't know. I know that evolution exists because we are continually changing. I also know that humans have such yeah. a huge wide spread that, that we're not a sole source of origin. In other words, there were lots of different trials, you know. So you got alpha, beta, th all the way to theta, omega, you know, oh, we like this version, let's, let's go ahead and, you know, promote that one for a while and so on. Uh, so um, that's really where we're at as, as humans. But this is our great strength, I think, right? Yeah. It's kind of like, um, uh, you know, we've, we've suffered so much, we've seen it from so many different angles from so continuously that uh, we're really strong sons of bitches. We can get out there, we can take it and give it right back. Now, if we can just get our heads right as we go through this period of, of space and not react to the energies and kill each other, yeah. uh, and that may may be what what causes great world wars. Yeah, you know, we, we know for instance the energies. Yeah, correct. And yeah. we know for instance that we went through. Here's here's a really terrible thing to suggest that maybe this was the cause of the great um, uh, Mongol hordes sweeping through uh, Asia and down into um, the Middle East and into Northern Africa. It may have been the same conditions that we're facing because it was coincidentally in the same kind of weather conditions that were being created by uh, Jupiter and, and Saturn as they tug on our orbits yet again. And this happens every 420 years. And if you go back this cycle, you find out, oh, geez, you know, it was the, the Maunder Minimum. Oh, geez, it was the Black Death at that time. Yeah. And oh, if you go back even further, oh, it was the, the quote, Yellow Horde, you know, the Huns invading um, Europe. And if you go back further, oh, it was the great Mongol invasion that destroyed and altered Asia for centuries. So did the Mongols react not only to the climate change, but also to their uh, condition uh, of having to suffer the energies and so on, right? Did they become the, um, the people that were so feared uh, that, you know, whole cities would just surrender and uh, the top leaders were going out to get their heads chopped off in, in hope that they wouldn't slaughter everybody else in the town? <laughs> So, and was that caused by these energies from space? I'm hoping not. Gerda Jeff and some of the other thinkers in the 1800s were quite certain yes. that we would face this again. Yes. Yeah. At the very beginning of your recent report, you talk about sun disease. And since we're talking about these energies coming in and people's crazy reactions to it, um, can you elaborate on that for, for the listeners a little bit, what you're speaking about? Sure. The, the sun disease at first, it, it was very, one of the very first things I encountered in doing this work and it was an artifact of uh, what I was actually attempting to do at the time, which was to make money with the predictive linguistics, finding out which stocks would get have an emotional edge, kind of what I do with the cryptos at the moment, right? Well, I was trying to do it with stocks, not understanding that the stock market was manipulated, and so all of my results didn't make any sense. But the very first long-distance run I made brought back, I was after SUN, S-U-N, which was the stock ticker for Stanford University Network, which made all kinds of computer gear and stuff, right? Yes, yes. And so, and really good stuff. I loved it, you know. Mm. And so I was going to, I was after that. I wanted to see how they were going to do, yeah. and I was going to, that was going to be my first target. And so instead of that, I got tons of data about the sun, as in the big scary ball in the sky. And I thought, what's this doing in here? Because I'd done a whole lot of stuff to filter that out, went in and looked at it, and it was associating sun with disease and bad effects on humans over and over and over again. And it got me intrigued, you know. And the next run I did, now bear in mind that it was uh, difficult in the beginning. I would do one, I did one run in 1997, and it took me almost all of 1998 to do the data analysis uh, because we were dealing, I didn't know what to throw out at the time. So it took me a long time to get to the point where I could do a run very quickly and know what to discard. And yet persistently over each and every run, year after year after year after year, was sun disease, sun disease, sun disease. And then you'd get these weird effects that it would talk about it in the long distance data, uh, the long-term values, which are from 19 months uh, on out. Um, it, uh, it would talk about the sun disease affecting us so bad that people would be in the room, walk out onto the balcony, and keel over just that rapidly. Or somebody would be walking across the street 
and go into kind of like a fugue state or sort of an epileptic seizure, and they'd never had anything like that, and it was related to the sun. Someone would go out to ha uh, help them, and they would also be struck, and pretty soon you'd have a whole pile of people in the middle of the street that, you know, are, are basically having some kind of a seizure. They're not dead, they're just totally incapacitated. When drug into a building, they recover. And so this kind of thing was described in the, uh, in the data sets. And so I thought, okay, well, maybe I better go check this out. I went and checked it out. And we have all these weird things in history, right? One of them is local to me. I live in Washington state up in the uh, far northeast corner of our state is a, a county called Ponderai. Ponderai has got these caves. You can't go visit them anymore because our government has decided that it's not safe for humans to see whatever it is is it's <laughs> in these caves. And so they've roped it off. One of the things we know that is in the caves, the, the first off, uh, the caves were studied and the uh, uh, estimate is that the humans lived in these caves uh, either intermittently or continuously for almost 40,000 years. Um, they were very conveniently situated near rivers and all of this, so it made sense that people would be cave dwellers there, right? Anyway, though, uh, the art on the inside of the caves repeatedly shows uh, hands with sticks with, with green leaves on them being stuck outside the mouth of the cave, catching on fire. Wow. And then the hand being pulling them back in. So they wow. were basically describing, uh, you know, strange energies from space. And if you look at petroglyphs all over Hawaii, yeah. you see the descriptions of the sun being really weird and sending out uh, uh, lightning from the sun. And you see these uh, shocking images in the Maori uh, of lightning coming down and carving the earth. And the Maori being in New Zealand saw the blue glow of this energetic structure that carved out uh, what may be the Grand Canyon or something, some part of it. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about, you know, ancient legends way back um, that, are, that, are, that are the modern Maori are basically interpreting off of petroglyphs, uh, you know, uh, graphics carved into stone. Now, these people, you got to think about this, right? If I want to make a graphic, it's nothing. I can drop paint, Photoshop, womp, 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 and it's done. But these people had to work months sometimes to chisel this stuff into really hard rock. They wanted us to understand that this yeah. was powerful medicine stuff here, right? One of the things that we see in the stone represented from the Maori all the way through uh, Micronesia into Polynesia is the concept of blue. And there, there's various different ways they get this across in stone that is basically gray because this is not painted or anything. It, it's within the glyph itself. And so they're describing these conditions that we now see start to arrive, okay? Uh, one of those was uh, noticed and put into, I think his, his channel is uh, Adapt2030, and he talks about the coming ice age. And he happened to catch a video that shows this weird blue glow that's in this forest. Now, it could be a space alien, it could be a spaceship, it could be a, any number of things, but if it is, a formation of plasma energy, it may certainly then be thought of as a precursor to these large uh, lightning strikes. And they're not really strikes, it's, it's a um, ionosphere to, uh, to uh, a planet ground of huge amounts of electricity that are building up in the ionosphere. And we also have to uh, remember that our, our ionosphere has been shrunken by these energies over these past few years. So it's a lot damn closer. This, almost, all, sounds this is like the Schumann resonance alteration, yeah. okay. by the way. Yeah. This almost sounds like Thunderbolts of the Gods by Wallace, was it Wallace Thornhill? Uh, book I, read. Uh, I don't think I've read that one. Okay, Maybe I so did. it basically <laughs> predicates certain, certain aspects of cosmology and I guess ancient period ca ca catastrophics is having occurred as a result of that same phenomena that you're describing there. Yeah, it's Wallace Thornhill. It's called uh, Thunderbolts of the Gods. It was. I have to check it out. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I can send you a link for it. Some, somewhere here, I've got it on my bookshelf. But, it, you know, this is a, again, a recurrent kind of vestigial kind of memory that sits in, 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 in us inside our DNA some way. It's, you're talking about this. Yeah. You know, it kind of triggers certain responses in the psyche where you, you, you kind of, you know, it's, it's a well, response, it's a primal response. Yeah, well, here's the thing. Uh, I don't want to be contradictory to everything that people think they might know, but DNA is not as it's been described to us. No, yeah, of course no, not. not at all. No, no. 
you know, so in that sense, DNA resonates all the time. It's creating yes. biophotons all the time. It's this yep. reactive stuff going on. And it, and it may indeed be our actual connection from the physical corporeal form to our memories. Yes. All right. So our memories may go through that. We know that the scientists have decided that uh, there are triggers that reach into epigenetics and cause mm -hmm. changes within us. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I can be an addict and I can smoke and smoke and smoke but I can figure out the trigger in my own head Ooh. that causes me to, to epigenetically change so that I'm no longer an addict and I don't have to smoke anymore. Now, I could maybe, if I knew how to do it, because we are so malleable, I could maybe figure out the epigenetic trigger wherever it might be and cause melanin to grow in my skin. Right. right? Um, uh, so uh, I, I maybe even grow hair. <laughs> Who knows? Don't but, but do any it. Event, Don't do it. No, 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 no. I, I, it's a waste of time at this point. It's my heat sink anyway. Um, but but the, uh, the, the point being that uh, epigenetics is not really as we understand it. So maybe the Taoists are right, okay? And so I know this guy. And um, uh, his, his name is John Chang. All right, they, they put videos out on it. And he's this Taoist master. He's maybe one of the last of the traditional Taoist masters alive. And he can't take humans uh, around him too much. And he's got these rules that he lives by because of the way he came up. <laughs> we right? struggle with them too. <laughs> oh, yes, exactly. Yes, they're, they, they, they're very annoying sometimes. Yeah. But his, his issue is, of course, that he's a true Taoist and he can do the, um, uh, the generation of key energy and he can actually heal you on the spot, right? right. Cause your bones to, to knit and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. he can, you can crumple up newspaper and put it out in front of him and he'll do this, you know, from feet away. Absolutely. Yeah. And you did the newspaper and the newspaper catches fire. He's sending his chi out there. And this causes him some um, uh, effort and, and it's an energy exchange and he doesn't do these parlor tricks uh, lightly because of that energy exchange. But he can do things like, you know, uh, cause one point of matter to merge into another. And so um, individuals like this, as, uh, as the Taoist methodology, okay, the Taoist discovered that basically anybody could be made like this, should they have the desire yes. to make themselves over. You cannot be turned into this, so you couldn't, couldn't be made into this kind of super soldier, soldier, but you could decide that you were going to be this way and, and follow their precepts and it would work. But it, so the very first part of that epigenetic journey is desire, which is a hormone, which is part of the will, which is part of the thinking and part of the mind. So, yeah. so your mind actually is ultimately in control of the epigenetics. So it's up to totally. us to decide uh, uh, within awareness where we're going to put our awareness and what epigenetics we're going to trigger. And this is very difficult, okay? Very, very, very difficult. Most humans never, ever change. They're on a life path, and they just keep going and going and going, doing those, those patterns over and over again. Krishnamurti talked about it. Uh, yeah. You get to a certain point, and you recognize these patterns, and you start busting out of them. Yeah. And it becomes truly a marvelous, amazing thing, because then uh, once you're no longer captivated in the, that part of it, every moment is an amazing experience, good, bad, or indifferent. Yeah. It is truly amazing. You know, yeah, I'm suffering greatly, but wow. <laughs> you know? I've actually been, I've actually been engaging in a practice that's something like this recently. And it is quite, it is quite amazing. I don't think I have it down or I'm expert at it yet, but it's been certainly an eye opening experience for me. Um, so yeah, I encourage people to engage in these kinds of practices. <laughs> and also look at the thinking too that gets there, all right? Yeah. Uh, because if you, if you acknowledge this, as modern Western science does, that epigenetics is very key to how humans behave, and that if you can trigger epigenetics, you can do everything from curing disease to causing mind changes, yep. then, then also you can think to yourself, hmm, maybe I don't have to not only do these patterns, but maybe I can explore whole new um, elements of what it means to interact with uh, matter and universe. Yeah. And then you start realizing, yeah. oh, geez, I'm not this body. <laughs> and yeah. it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> and in fact, this body, this thing that's moving around is actually encapsulated inside of what me is. And me has absolutely no name at all. And that us foolish things here, us corporeal um, condensates, are giving each other labels and we call these names. Right. And from that point on, it becomes very, very comic. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. the whole- well, I the, think the, anybody, the, you know, I think anybody that's gone through disciplines of any level, spiritually, meditation, or even the entheogen route, 
at some point, if they've had an honest experience, recognizes that the separation from the identifier with the physical body, the separation from the ego, and the sense the consciousness isn't local, which is, you know, yeah. something that people really that's struggle a big shock with. Too. Yeah. That's a big <laughs> shock. But the idea that that's, that's a game changer, because at that point, you suddenly realize there's something a whole hell of a lot bigger out there. And it isn't local, and it isn't physical. And it's what we talk about all the time, which is basically doing kind of a collapse, where you collapse down to a singularity point, and then you can expand back out again, consciously. And okay, let's stop right there for a second, because you're talking just Cozy Rev's language. Okay, <laughs> because he was always talking about the collapse of, of potentiality and probability into reality and how we could affect and delay that. So, so I mean, you're, you're right back on in line with him. So go ahead. No, 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 and that was really my point. My point was so much of what I've tried to communicate over the last eight years of doing this in some nuanced way is that you have to stop. You have to bring things down to a single point. There's a still point. I learned this when I was 15, 16 years old. I learned how to meditate and I followed the Tao teachings. I mean, just the philosophy of it itself was liberating. But one thing that I discovered was no matter how screwed up I was, no matter how psychologically damaged, physically damaged, whatever shit I was going through, if I did this exercise, if I just stopped, and did the collapse and let things go to a singularity, I then had the ability to begin to expand back out again from a point that I had not been at the point where I had to do that stop, which you called earlier, freeze. Most people right. never, we, we hear about fight and flight. Nobody brings up freeze. Yeah. And I think and, this you know, is hugely important. Well, what you were talking to about the, uh, the uh, consciousness and the, um, nature of hunting for that point of collapse okay mm -hmm. look at look at this look at where we're at right at the moment i think we rep we are reflecting what was in the 1930s again around that idea because in the 30s we had all of these religions springing up where people felt something they were responding mm -hmm. to sensations that their body had that intruded in on their consciousness that made them seek for answers they didn't know what they were seeking. They knew they were seeking, though, and that led them to the traditional avenues that seekers normally went through, and we had religions and cults spring up all over. Sort of like the charismatic renewal, Amy Semple McPherson, uh, the, the evangelists. Tent revivals, exactly. My dad used to tell me about the tent revivals, the guys that went, the circuit runners. They yeah. basically would set up in a dirt lot, sawdust somewhere, put up a big tent. They'd stay in town for a week, pass the hat every night. Guys would come in and throw their whiskey bottles. It was illegal at that point, obviously. But this yep. was yep. this whole thing, you know, the, the whole gestalt, the speaking in tongues, the mystical experience, all of that. It was well. It was permitted inside the tent. See, yes, you could you could have that experience inside mm -hmm. there. Now, over the the fifties and sixties, the tents were restricted and put off into the background we didn't want to allow that in our society the mm. society the social order changed right. we weren't seeking anymore we were under different influences now we're back there and the 50s 60s 70s we burst out again we're coming into the new age period of time where we're still feeling that and we're still seeking that but this time there's no tense and so what are we to do we can't have those mystical uh, out of bounds experiences that we know to be liberating that we need at that moment just to get the energies out of us uh, that, uh, you know, probably drove our great ancestors to ingest psychedelics uh, for that same purpose because they're so cleansing of these kind of energies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and at that same time, we don't have the tense to allow us to have these experiences. And so we have the new age and they, and that we got to the point where it's busting out into a much larger population. There's more of us that are responsive to it, more of us feeling it. And so it's much more in your face everywhere as, as we're uh, all trying to, you know, do the stuff that should have been done in the tent and have our little revival and get that experience out and try and integrate it. Only we don't have those integrational tools anymore. And that's why all this stuff's going on. And of course, what does it lead to? It leads to the people that say, hey, what is there out there? I see a twitch. The herd is twitching. 
maybe I can make some money off of it. You know? <laughs> now let's get in and, you know, right. let's get digging into it there and see what we can come up with. And that's the kind of stuff, you know, uh, I'm really an egalitarian. I'm a yogi, right? I yeah. mean, I do, I do yoga at, at, at a core mm -hmm. damn level. And so at a core damn level, you can't be a yogi and have pretense about who you are and this, the yeah. stuff that you're, you're in, right? And so mm -hmm. as a result of that, you don't want to see anybody else also who's in this stuff, the bodies, to, to be uh, sheared. It's true, it's their own destiny. And you can take as a yogic perspective, you can stand back and allow these people to be idiots, <coughs> to be sheared by you know, the cults and be taken advantage of and that kind of thing. But also as a yogi, as Baba G even says, you know, it is your choice, right? Yeah. You, can, you can decide to exit now and go forever into the infinite stream. Or I'll sit here through the sun cycle and see what trouble I can cause. <laughs> so uh, I guess all this leads us to the point where it's time to address the bluebird in the room. <laughs> Exactly, the big giant space chicken. <laughs> yeah, I love, I love, I, I love that you call it the blue chicken. I, I, I just refer to it as the blue birds. I refuse to use the other term, but I, I love Our, that you call it the yeah. blue chicken. Chicken cordon bleu. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, there's um, a lot of questions. You know, do these guys lay eggs? <laughs> do they squawk? <laughs> they, they lay spheres. The sphere being. Oh, right? okay, okay. <laughs> so you know, yeah, you. you um, I was not surprised to see you begin to speak of some of this stuff at about almost the very similar time that we really started to speak about it. And so, um, and I like the way you speak about it and you're just as pissed off as we are about this. And so uh, let's get into this. I mean, uh, this is um, from your perspective, like what is this nonsense? <laughs> uh, let me add another layer to it and Please. make the mystery even deeper, okay? Before we get into it at all, I've discovered something that uh, a few weeks back, I didn't really know what venue I was going to bring it out. This is a perfect venue for it, because I think there's an even greater level of conspiracy going on around the big blue space chickens. All right? Yeah. And, and, and I noticed this from a techie viewpoint. <coughs> if you go and do a search on YouTube, and you go to YouTube, and you just pop on in, and you put up in the search in there, you put in Corey Good. Or, and you can do this now, it's starting to fade away, but uh, you can also do uh, Blue Avians, uh, David Wilcock, uh, mm -hmm. Gaia TV, uh, a few of these, right? You're going to be presented with a page. None of that information is going to be negative. Maybe one or two articles are going to be, uh, videos will show up about this in a negative fashion, have any kind of negative connotation at all, and that's only recent. You would have to go to the second and third and fourth page to encounter any of your guys' work, any of dark journalists, any of these people. Now, the reason that this is, or the way that this is being done was through the SEO, search engine optimization tools, and flooding. So someone went to the trouble of creating a template mask and flooding the subject matter in the language within the search engines for YouTube and Google such that it drove down any of the negative impressions and they kept doing it and kept doing it and kept doing it with new material every time uh, any negative thing about the blue space chicken cult showed up. And they were still doing it a couple of days ago. So who is doing this? And is it being done with officialdom's approval? Because this level of SEO is not easily done. This level of SEO usually gets the person that's doing it in great trouble with Google. Uh, okay, they usually get their yeah, shit, yeah. shit kicked exactly out of them by right, Google. Yeah. So, so it's like, hmm, this, this level of coordinated, consistent spamming with the same templates, the same traits to it, uh, the same uh, uh, byte code size, it's like, what's going on here? And uh, so that level of the mystery really deepens it all. You know, how deep does this go? Is this indeed an officialdom disinfo op to try and get the people away from the secret space program idea because it's getting way too damn close? Right. Yeah. I mean, to me, it's to me, it's it's the it's obviously like something being done intentionally from high up, but with the use of these inserted useful idiots. You know what I mean? I think that the people who are sort of like the Corey Goods and the David Wilcock, they they think they're occupying one position when they're really occu they're occupying a different position. Um, right. And, um, you know, yeah, like I agree that this is being done to take, take attention away from the serious aspects of this. And the way we look at it is secret space programs, multiple. I don't think there's not just one. Sure. 
So obviously we're dealing with, you know, what we've referred to like on the topsoil edge, um, the Catherine Austin Fitzes, the Joseph Farrells, <laughs> people like that. Um, you know, that's obviously, you know, and there, there's someone who I hope maybe you're aware of, and maybe you are because of the kind of work you do, but actually the person who we like that has done some of the best work on this and gets no attention is Sean Gattreau. I don't know if you know who Sean Gattreau is. He has a, a YouTube channel called Industrial Surrealism and his series is oh, called, sure. yes, Who, What, yeah, is yeah. Exercise. This person, yeah, this, yes. Sean has documented more evidence of, a, of secret space programs than anybody has. And no one ever refers to his, I mean, really, we've had him on the show multiple times. Roxy Lopez has had him on. A few others have, you know, he's been on Clyde Lewis and some of these other slightly bigger shows, but they never let him get really deep into what he's doing. Right. Uh, so there's that end, but, and I would love to get your take on this. And this is the part that gets, I think this in some ways is even what the Corey Good nonsense is meant further to distract from. The, the, the mind control aspects of the secret space program, right? And the fact that, there, that those, th those things, mind control, MKUltra kind of things are also tied into this. And we, we don't see any, um, you know, we speak about this a lot on the show. We speak to a lot of people who, you know, with, you know, are trying to understand their experiences. They're not coming forward with evidence and saying, I know for a fact this to be true. Yeah. Yeah. People, there's a large group of people who have experiences that would seem to line up with having had something that they were tried, that they, they were being wanting shit, to- Shit don't make sense. Shit right. don't make sense. <laughs> shit don't make sense. And you know, whether they went to space or whether they were mind controlled into thinking they went to space, you know, whatever. And they but, can't say, and that, that I find legitimate. Okay, right. I find that legitimate. Yes. But yeah. if, you're, if you're up there saying yeah. it's definitively this right. way and so on, bullshit. Right, and I think that's what the thing with Corey Good is really meant to. It, obviously, we know that it's meant to detract from the tech, like the the technological and military aspects of it. But this other thing, where there's this increasing amount of people who are talking about these strange experiences they've had, and they don't want us coming together, talking to each other, and figuring shit out. So they put someone like Corey Good out there to like make a mockery of this stuff, and to make it so that people will not ever take the others seriously who are not claiming blue chickens who are not claiming sphere beings right. who are claiming right. who are, you know well the other side of this is that what what has happened with Corey good is that Corey good was basically pulled out of a milieu inside of a form at project avalon he presented initially presented a, a rather good case for somebody who would have been involved in in um special programs special access programs uh some type of mind control mk ultra type thing but what happened from there was how the narrative began to be honed once he transitioned out of avalon and there were there's a sequence to that there's a handoff to different handlers we detailed all of that in the course of the the two interviews we did with christine anderson and and the ruiner and also the documents that we put up the 150 pages of redacted uh online activity by Corey. Yeah. But the whole point was to begin to create a monolithic narrative that supplanted all the other narratives out there and also brought into the mix a cult structure of belief and a money, a, a money aspect. In other words, they, they basically have done what the televangelists, the modern era televangelists. Well, no, you, hit it, you hit it right there, Guy. Look, I mean, you're, you're spot on. We, what we have to ask ourselves is, who is Constantine? Okay, mm. because we've just lived through a secret version of the Council of uh, Nicaea. All the Christians, 1,200 yep. cults brought in. Yeah. One single monolithic narrative go yeah. out and tied to money. Yes. Yeah. So my original... <laughs> My you know, original Facebook post was rather simple. It wasn't crafted. It was me responding to Corey Good, and it was largely, "This is the image of a cult." Yeah. Because when you look at it and you saw the semiotics, the triggers that were in it, yeah. all of the yeah. aspects, you you suddenly realize this isn't your run-of-the-mill tent show UFO thing. There's something bigger below the surface of this. This is social engineering. Okay. Yes, yes it is. It's yeah. social, totally. Yes. And from my viewpoint, I see it in the language, of course. And so I see it. Yeah. Uh, I'm out there doing battle in language land, right? And what someone's trying to do is they're trying to control the, the narrative by mm -hmm. seizing and wrapping language in particular images. Yeah. And they do it. They're changing the context and changing the connotation of the words. 
And so they're trying to have, um, and that's why I deliberately choose the words I do. Those are my weapons, right? Mm. Blue avians or, you know, giant space chickens, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Okay, hey, I win the war, guys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can try and be as, as upfront as you want, but if I start laughing at these giant blue space chickens, you know, other people are also going to see it that way and you've, and you've lost that image. Yeah. That's right. And so that's what they're trying to do is to control this weird narrative around a whole set of language that all points back to the secret space programs or, or the origin of them and, and a hidden history. And so I think that really the, what they're actually trying to control is the history aspect of it more than anything at the moment. But I don't know, I, I'm not, I'm not going to say why I don't answer why questions. It goes to intent and I'm not one of the bad guys. So I don't know why they're trying to do this, but I, but I am able to look at the language and see what the Corey good stuff is doing. And it's really weird. This is why I was so pissed. Okay. Because I have an emotional engine, this engine goes through and it reads words and it, and it makes assumptions and it makes conclusions about the words it's reading based on my emotional quantifiers and qualifiers that I put together to those words. And it sums them up. And so it presents to me a summation uh, in my overnight on the processing as to various different groups and the emotional uh, values for these. And I started seeing, and, and I react to those emotional values uh, to do my interpretation. No sense me trying to do an interpretation on an emotional value that basically no one's going to care about, right? So the hot topics are of, you know, uh, earthquakes or, you know, planet Nib uh, Nibiru and all of this kind of stuff. I can pick up real easy and I know, okay, I can get in there because everybody's emotionally hot about it. I started seeing these emotional waves come up out of the the context within my data sets and couldn't figure out what it was because I was deliberately screening out all of the Hollywood uh, aspects of the Corey Good story, so I didn't even see it. I mean, I wasn't aware in the data that Corey Good was out there talking about these big blue space chickens for maybe a whole year after he'd done it. <laughs> so it's like, whoa, what's going on? Then I realized that they were um, deliberately uh, promulgating an emotional reaction, and maybe to do epigenetically, maybe mind control in that mm -hmm. regard to grab a particular component of the narrative to pull along a segment of the population. And it looked like from the narrative that I, or from the language I was seeing that they were doing it in such a way and a manner that they were trying to do what Amy Semple McPherson's handlers did to create the larger mass movement and cult yep. to allow it to spread out. Right. Yeah. And, and so it gave birth to all of this, started giving birth to all of these little sub organizations. Uh, and whenever I see that, I get really suspicious. I got suspicious of Simon Parks for that same reason, right? Um, mm -hmm. Not only the same kind yeah. of bullshit stuff. Yeah, yeah true. And, and true. Okay. I have ingested psychedelics and I've had conversations with mantids. All right. Mm -hmm. So I know they exist. Do they exist in this material plane? I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Are they his parents? I couldn't say, but it sure sounds far-fetched and I'm not going to buy into it. And right. the fact that it's cult-like with the reaching out, the, the umbrella. Well, and the here, again, there's, here again, there's underlying character issues as well with Simon Parks. I don't even have to dispute this. We covered this last year with Simon Parks, that there are character issues, just as there are character issues within the camp of David Wilcock, Corey Good, Michael Sala, Guy on TV, and William Yeah, Tompkins. okay. Yeah, but, but okay, but we got to be clear about that. We're all humans, right? We've all got character right, issues. We We've all got crap it's, in our yes. past we don't want yeah, brought up, sure. you know? Okay, so David Wilcox's first public appearance, he was a time travel time traveler from the year 2072. And then right? he was Edward, Edgar Case, and then he was... <laughs> no, no, no. Hey, I actually buy that. Okay, I actually buy the Edgar Casey stuff, and here's why. Because I'm aware that there's actually a battle going on through time. Yeah. I'm aware that we reincarnate. Yes. And I'm aware that when we do reincarnate, we reincarnate and take the template that is our... Uh, okay... Uh, when our mothers become pregnant, they are uh, uh, pregnant and producing a rather amorphous, generic uh, human shape. Right. Our soul, soul brings soul brings along, right? It, uh, well, no, our our soul comes along and is ingested basically yeah. in the breath of the woman at the time she's uh, uh, of conception, and the soul impresses the our body shape on that amorphous mass yeah. and as we go through time our soul collects all of this stuff from our dna to carry with us through our our death and our metempsychosis into our next life so that we will have the experiences we need the scars that are all over my body uh, mm -hmm. at this point are from previous lives I, and issues i, I hadn't resolved right yeah. and that and that's the way this stuff works so so we're all totally damn flawed and we're all working patterns that uh, probably we should not <laughs> yeah, no, I, right? I, 
I agree with the way you just described that with, you know, like the soul sort of attracts to this amorphous blob. And yeah, I mean, I kind of agree with that. We talk about that. I don't know if you ever saw that episode of Fringe called Soul Magnet. Soul no, I, no, I, no, I didn't. No. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, would, I wouldn't use the term magnet because it's a little bit different than that, right? It's very much like a, um, uh, a mold. And, and so our mold is the stuff we bring with us from the, from the previous life right. that is impressed on our body that we have to decide to deal with, ignore, or decide not to deal with. Okay. And, and so those are basically the three choices, the yeah, fight, I, flight, or freeze, right? Yeah, no, yeah I, li I, like, your, I yeah. like your description, though. I'm with you on that. Okay, and so well, that's what goes down on that part of it, though. Yeah. So I, I have a quick question. Do yeah. you, we've brought this up before, but I want to ask you because you look into language. When you look at this whole phenomenon with the blue chickens, do you see the relationship to that this would be some new, like new age playing out of Project Bluebird? Are you familiar with what Project Bluebird yeah. was? Right. So it, it, was, it was precursor to Artichoke and MKUltra. And it was basically, you know, experiments conducted to create amnesia, new identities, hypnotic access codes, and new memories in the minds of experimental subjects. Could that be what this is about with this tighter group and then a the larger group that you were speaking about? That this is some sort of, you know, version of that? And they're, they're it could be. I'd never thought of it that way yeah. because I was looking at it in an entirely different layer. Okay. Yeah. I see it a much plainer as a battle between force A and force B. I right. can't figure out from what I'm seeing whether force A is attempting to do this or, or not. That would certainly fit with what I'm seeing in terms of the attempt to control the narrative and the language. Yeah. And, and there's a, certainly an attempt to, to slice off language and allow them to control it. And so we see this with the recent Jimmy Church uh, enforcing of the social parameters. So now, okay, let's, let's be clear about this, all right? Bring me back to Jimmy Church in a minute, but here's, okay. here's the deal. This could be organic or this could be structured, and we can't tell looking at it from the outside. So this could be a military op. You could have had people like my father and all of these guys sitting around in a room planning this for weeks and writing all this shit down, picking out their, their characters, yeah. working out the strategy and all of that. Or... It could be the happenstance that occurs all the time in life where one person's story triggers something in somebody else. They react a particular way because of the crap they're bringing from their previous life, life. that they've got to go through now. They're attracted to the cult because they didn't deal with it when they were a vestal virgin in Rome, that kind of <laughs> thing, right? And so, so they got to deal with it now. Uh, and, and so they're just taking it. These people are just taking advantage of all of the people that used to be the vestal virgins that didn't yeah. get their, their religion stuff done. Now, these people that are doing this, the sociopaths and the psychopaths may not be the sociopaths and psychopaths acting in and of that action. They may be directed, they may be consciously controlling their psychopathy uh, in order to uh, harvest these people, as Catherine Austin Fitz says, yeah. or, or they could be responding to their own patterns that they've just got to get out because they've been a, you know, on the sociopathic path for years and years and year, or, or lifetime after lifetime and lifetime, and they just don't ever get it, right? And so that's what we've, we've got to do. And so we have to understand that this is not uh, something we can ascertain at this stage. Okay. It is wise to keep in mind that maybe it is all controlled and scripted and there's a good playwright behind all of this. And that's when you start, once you start thinking that though, then you start asking why and who. And I don't usually go to that at this stage. So what got us off on that? What were we coming back to? You wanted to come back to Jimmy, Jimmy Church, you said. Okay, so, so me, Jimmy Church. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, I was just going to say, so Jimmy Church recently did this thing, uh, unity in the community. All right, that's tent revival language, yeah, right? That's, totally. that's, you're free within the tent to be in our community, right? But if you step outside that tent, you step outside Well, that's community. what contact in the desert was. Yeah, contact exactly. Contact in the desert yeah. was, in fact, a tent revival meeting for ufology that was and there was yeah. predictive language that i put out and that yeah. we put out months before yeah. the contact in the desert announcement we were talking about conferences and the harvesting that goes on at conferences this was which not, is scary yeah terrifying. which is yeah. you know people don't understand and, and i'm putting the show together to lot, try and lay the narrative out because it's it's very difficult for people to track especially because we're being blown constantly now with media and it's all fragmented mm -hmm. but this was not something that we just pulled out of our orifice this was something that was an organic process with us talking about conferences specifically ufo conferences and specifically the harvesting operations that go on concerted by agency intelligence operatives cult groups 
satanic ritual groups, all of these. And, and why? And why? It's because you're a temporal sensitive and you can feel it coming months yeah. in advance. And, and, that's, yeah, and so yeah. it's not that much. Again, you know, we work on the same planes. You have a science to this, whereas we're just sort of barometers out there that, that pick these things up. But it's the same discipline of language. And I thought it was interesting that the term infiltration of the UFO communities <laughs> was used specifically by Jimmy Church, <laughs> yeah. when in fact that was the language that came out in the post that I put onto Facebook that started on April 23rd. Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 the exact scene, the alt media and UFO scene is now fully co-opted. It's a different word, but it means relatively the same yeah. thing. Got to control that language. Got to cycle it up. You know, it's got to yeah. be ours, yeah. right? Right. And so we claim so, it, again, and that's how we do it. Yeah. We appropriate. And by yeah. appropriating it, we then control the narrative. That's right. what this really is about. This isn't a pissing contest between us, them. I don't care. No, Go no, no. Hang desert. on, hang on, hang on. I'm pissed. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, then you have a right to be pissed. They yes. caused me a lot. They caused me a lot of work, yes. and I've got to go back and tune my lexicon because they're yes. bubbling out emotions that caused me to tune the lexicon to those emotions. Now I got to undo that because some of my work went wonky because I was working for 18 months trying to get them out of the system, and I didn't know. So yes, I'm extremely irritated. <laughs> well, and, 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 and it might be useful to explain because we assume that, be, and, and I've heard you explain this at least twice now, but I won't assume for the purposes of this audience that they know exactly what you're talking about. That in fact, when you discovered this showing up, and I'll let you kind of lace it from there because you did something very clever that well, sort of busted okay. them. Yeah, I sort of thought, uh, uh, when I first started seeing this, I kind of wondered what was going on, because ever since 2000, and, well, ever since 2001, I've been paranoid that my system could be infiltrated itself or manipulated by mm -hmm. um, uh, intrusion of language out into the internet in a, in a bot fashion. And actually, I was able to discover in 2005 the origination of the first bots that were writing articles and uh, then being read by news anchors. And it was 100% software creation of headlines. And so I was like, wow, they're really doing this stuff. And so I was very concerned about this. I come across these rising emotional tones I have to start reacting to. I wonder basically what's going on. It's around specific language, around specific sites within the language. And so I decided, okay, it appeared to be an echo of some of the stuff I was writing but a slightly different echo, as we say, a constrained, controlled version of the language I was mm -hmm. putting out. And I was trying, uh, we have this thing called MOM, Model of Model Space. Very first time I put out a big prediction, which was about 9-11, the next time I did a run, it just came back with nothing but my own words and I had to throw it all out, start all over again, because I needed to isolate my own crap that was then being you know, spewed around in the internet, and regurgitated. So I couldn't have those memes or that stuff intrude. I had to be able to figure out a way to do it. I came up with this thing I called MOM, which is model of model space, where I take all of the stuff I write, put it into these blobs that are easily searched in a binary fashion, or excuse me, in a hexadecimal fashion, stuff them into a database and with some uh, triggers and so forth and some uh, stored procedures and uh, let it work. And it tells the spiders, no, you can't bring that data back. It's most likely some of his own stuff uh, going. Now, of course, as I've gotten more presence, I've had to have mom get bigger and bigger, and it takes more of the processing. It's just this huge pain yeah. in the ass. So I resented uh, these blue chicken dudes, right? Because they were causing me a lot of work. I didn't know it was the blue chicken guys because I wasn't looking at the language that way. I would get a word, and I would see heightened emotions around the word that I would try and tune into because I know something was happening, right? Why, for instance, should Antarctica pop up? And why should it have a sudden heightened emotion that would raise it from a seven in my scale to a 10 point something? It's like, ooh, ooh, something's coming up there, right? And so I would write about this in one of my reports. And then the next month, when I'm doing the processing for the next month, it went from, you know, 10.4 up to 12.3. It's like, wow, something, we're getting close. Something's really happening here. And what was going on was the blue chicken guys were reading my reports and it finally dawned on me, it is an echo, but it's a filtered echo. There, that someone was trying to control the narrative or piggyback off of the words I was using. And I couldn't figure out why for one reason, because the stuff they were picking up on was all the woo-woo stuff. It wasn't any of the economic stuff I figured would be the, the target. And so uh, uh, it got to be kind of a pain. And so I ended up having to make some experiments and I made some experiments. I put three, um, uh, I did three experiments over the course of, uh, of six months and I put in three different memes that I then saw replicated in the blue chicken cult. And so it, it 
came back to me, okay, somebody in there is reading and writing their script off of the uh, space goat farts section of my reports. And I could alter, uh, I actually was able to alter the flow in Gaia on how long and how voluminous I put into my space goat farts section in a report. That next month, wow. uh, Corey Good and Gaia and stuff, flat as hell. <laughs> wow. So, so, so it's just kind of funny, right? Yeah. I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that the ideas that he was promulgating were mine. Okay. I'm saying that I put in specific linguistic triggers to cause specific actions. And I can now plot those actions and tell you on this month, I did this. And if we go and look at Guy TV for the next subsequent couple of months, you're going to see this effect in it. And sure enough, lo and behold, and you can see my reports out a month ahead, two months ahead of that effect showing up in the Corey Good story. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> you're, you're, what do I do with it? What do I do with it, though? Right? It's just a claim. It's as it's as bold a claim as Corey's claim that he got sucked up into this weird blue egg and flown to Antarctica. Right? I can substantiate mine. Right. Yeah. Uh, but again, it's sort of like conjecture that they're actually doing that from my words, even though you can see the words transmit. Yeah. And, you know, they didn't. They weren't using those words two months before. They weren't talking about the subjects two months before. Yeah, it's, it's you're you're the kind of tricky bastard that they didn't, you know, they thought that <laughs> yeah. they'd steal well, your work why. and then not count on that you'd use it to figure them out. So, yeah. Well, here's here's why too. Here's what really irritated me, okay? Cuz Antarctica is important. When when I find stuff show up in the data, I don't just assume that it's going to be accurate or anything because humans are goofy bastards and they'll get all whipped up about stuff that is absolutely false and delusional. So I go and do whatever research I, is necessary to make me feel comfortable that by writing it in this report, I'm not going to mislead people. Now, I don't mind coming across looking like an old wild ass bald guy out in the woods. All right, this is, this is who cares, who cares? But I certainly don't want to cause, I, I follow a ahimsa, all right? I'm a yogi, do no harm. Yeah. So my very first principle is do no harm. And so I want to make sure that the crap I put in the reports is not going to cause uh, a reaction and behavior yeah. that would cause blowback that way. And so one of the things I did was I investigated Antarctica. And I mean, I got serious about that. I spent hours crawling on uh, every single satellite photo I could get, analyzing what's going on down there. And I was shocked, absolutely shocked. Uh, being a techie and, and having the spiders at my disposal, I sent them out looking in all the languages I could find that are within our, our system for um, words about jobs in Antarctica for this year and last year. And, and I discovered all kinds of solid real evidence, you know, like a Gary McKinnon kind of evidence, yeah. right? Uh, that something's happening down in Antarctica. You know, there's 900 more jobs now in Antarctica being offered than there were two months ago. They're hiring physical therapists in yeah. Antarctica, you know? Uh, they've got uh, people dentists are going to have stiff knees when they come out of uh, being frozen for so many millennia, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, those stasis fields. Oh, it's a bitch, you know? <laughs> got to have a massage. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, something's fact... going on though, see, that's the problem. That's what really pissed me off about these guys yeah. was they were polluting something that I found personally meaningful because, yeah. you know, when disclosure comes, it's not, I don't think it's going to come as we expect, right? Yeah. And the disclosure I care about is more about us. Yep. And, yeah. and if we can say, all yes. right, guys, humanity was created by an aquatic species about 200 million years ago. If we can say something along those lines and know with a definitive level of surety that this is the case, then a lot of the bullshit between us goes away. It don't matter if you're black, green, blue, white. It doesn't matter what color you are, right? We've all got this thing that we need to recover, which is us. And that's yeah. what we're all fighting about continuously is we don't know what us is. And once we get that straight, hey, universe is ours. We can go out and kick ass. Absolutely, I, I'm totally. So, so with this you. is this is why I'm pissed at these, yeah, these no, blue I, chicken guys, right? I, this is why I'm at war with they're, them. They're they're really distracting people from finding the answers within themselves. They're making they're, they're really, yeah. Well, okay, all right. I'm not that altruistic. <laughs> all right, yeah, they pissed but, me off because they polluted my data right. stream. <laughs> no, they polluted your idea stream. But what you just said is that yeah. the, informa the important yeah. information is about us, not about this other yeah. stuff. So yes, yeah. I, and they, that and that really irritates me too. By the way, all right. We yeah. get everything from Billy Meyer onward. As soon as the space aliens show up here, what do they talk about? 
not trade, not, hey, you know, what kind of a being are you? None of that. No, let's get into spirituality. Let's create us a religion. Let's talk about, right. you know, the great Palladian or, or uh, Pejorian Jesus that came back whenever and blah, blah, blah. Or this giant blue space chickens that are somehow, right. you know. And so I resent because I'm a Taoist, because I'm a yogi, because yeah. I, I am looking deep into myself to find out what yes. the hell I yeah. am. Yes. I, I resent someone from the outside yeah, trying too. to tell me what, what I am. That's and exactly. it's like, that, that was off. the it's, other point. That, yeah, that was exactly. the other point of this. When, when, when you go on to the websites and you look and it says, the blue avians have a message for you. And then it, it kind of talks <laughs> down to you. It's like, oh, you need to forgive yourself and forgive <laughs> others yeah, and understand. Yeah, yeah. These warnings were given two times before, and when they were ignored, yeah, civilization yeah. was destroyed. So now you've got, the, you've got a prophet, you've got an mm -hmm. auger of dark prophecies reliant on an external force that you need to believe in in order to reflect back to yourself the inherent good that we're supposed to find in ourselves in the first place as both individuals yeah. and a race. I resent that. Yeah. That is, you should that have is fear. a savior By the way, you've got to be program. Afraid. Yes, no, there's, have, there's, yeah. fear. there's fear. There's fear because only 400,000 of us are going to make it to whatever. Well, <laughs> yeah, and even, even beyond that, though, there's that fear of, oh, my God, it's on me. I've got to do this, you know? Yeah. yeah. yeah so, somebody... And they put that, all that work on you and stuff. It's like David uh, Wilcock. There was this um, conference with um, Bill Ryan in Ecuador or some, <laughs> some weird place, right? Mm -hmm. Way the hell back when. Um, and um, uh, an aside, a little snippet came to my attention, and it was this woman saying, blah, 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 Ascension, blah, 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 David Wilcock, blah, 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 I've been doing the work. And it's like, well, wait a second, woman. I've been a yogi. I've been doing yoga since I was 11, and I'm talking serious stuff, not mm -hmm. just the Osnas. Mm -hmm. right? I've been doing martial arts for 30-plus years. That's work, and you don't ascend from any of this stuff. And by the way, what do you think Ascension is? That you're going to float off with wings? Mm -hmm. I mean, the descriptions of these things are the very rapture. Vague. Yeah. Exactly. Rapture-like and, and all of this kind of stuff and vague as hell, but yet somehow there's work involved. There's a, a reward system. It's all structured. It's hierarchical. It's entirely structured mind control. And here it is coming out of somebody who's professing, David Wilcock, to be the great liberator or to bring us the great liberator. So is he the Moses in this play? Mm -hmm. I don't know, you know? Sure, it sure feels like it. Yeah. It's yeah. really it's scary. It's really it's scary. scary. I agree. There's, there's a coterie of control that goes on in this entire media circus. And I, I've, I've been seven years on this, of exposing this network of people. Now, funny, they're using the same language now. They're reflecting all this language back again. Uh, they've been blitzing my YouTube channels with messages from uh, Sphere Being Alliance, offering me to come over to their side right. before it's too late. That's the right. language they're giving me now. <laughs> this is, now, this is cult-like activity, and I'm documenting it. I'm, I'm recording the language. But you have had the usurpation of the meme, the hijacking of this entire initial warning about Corey Good, whereby then Bill Ryan used my post to escalate his argument which then advanced out onto the three-hour interview with the dark journalist, which now gave Bill Ryan the seeming appearance of being in control of a narrative that Bill Ryan lost control of years ago. Three, three years ago, at least. Right. And, you and it's the not church enforcing all this as the social enforcer. Is it, exactly. You've got to see yeah. it inside yeah. the tent. Yeah. Right? yeah. And I'm yeah. the person that decides unity in the unity. community. Unity, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah you know, they, like, they, I've been there, dude. I lived in the South. I understand passive-aggressive mm -hmm. control mechanisms. Exactly. You know? yeah. <laughs> it's like, hey, you know, you use this shit to control the slaves. I've seen the white people in the South who had natively internalized it, use it on black people all of my life. Because I was, yeah. I was raised in Alaska, right? I didn't come down to the lower 48 until I was uh, into my awareness stage of about seven or eight. And so, and we're plopped into the, the civil rights movement in the 60s or 50s, and it's like, wait a second, this shit don't add up, you know, uh, these yeah. black people, they're nice guys, I go on over and sit mm -hmm. in the porch every weekend, we have, you know, good food, and uh, yet, you know, they've got to be treated this way, this don't make any sense at all, and so none of it, you know, all the non sequiturs, so I started paying attention to language, and of course, I'm bringing that from my previous existence, undoubtedly, whoever the hell I was then, which gets us back to David Wilcock and the war through time, yeah. Obama being able to see himself in the statuary from Egypt, yeah. They're really into this, by the way, okay? 
let me tell you yeah. something. Let me tell you something. Yeah. I've got a friend of mine. All right. So, so uh, my father uh, was a very decorated soldier. He was an artist. He never should have been a soldier, but he was a very decorated soldier. Battlefield uh, commission in Korea uh, saved a hundred and some odd people in the lead them uh, the hell away from getting themselves destroyed, became an mm. officer and went through this entire thing, did three tours in Nam. One of the tours in Nam he did with this guy. Uh, we'll call him Mars, Colonel Mars, okay? And he saved Colonel Mars' life twice. Now, he wasn't a colonel at that time. Uh, the guy was a captain. And my dad was a, uh, he was a colonel and uh, at the time that he saved this guy's life twice. And so Mars felt, he always felt that he owed our family. And so years later, when I'm doing telephony work, I run into Mars. It's like, wait a second, you work here? Now, Mars is this very imposing fellow. He was a, he cashiered out of the military as a general. Uh, you know, the completely shaved head, you know, no eyebrows kind of look, right? And, and uh, he, he, he looks like Joe Rogan on a yeah. real serious good day. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> and, and he walks around like that, right? And so he's a good guy, though, I, I sort of thought. Uh, but he was working for a subcontractor for the military, all right? And so I don't know why I got onto this, but this guy uh, and the subcontractors, oh, I know. Okay, so this guy's really interesting. Uh, he sort of took a liking to me. We're in the same building. Uh, time passes. He and he's working for a subcontractor for the military that gets involved with, of all things, Abu Ghraib. The, you know, they supplied the people that went to work that were the torturers at that prison in, in the Iraq and stuff, this particular subcontracting outfit that Colonel Marr worked for. And they had to change their name and do stuff. After they changed their name and morphed, they were given a weird assignment, which I became aware of. That weird assignment was war through time. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what they were doing was scanning with computers, with facial recognition software, all kinds of historical paintings, photos of statues and stuff. If they heard about a statue of a human that had historical importance that they did not have a photo of, they paid somebody to go and get that photo if they had to put that guy on a plane and get him there. And they got these photos and were digitally analyzing these things. And they were hunting for... for people look like them. Correct. Yeah. Through and, and they were trying to plot this and there's something going on. And so they weren't looking for people that look like Obama, right? But they were looking for all these people that look like other people that, so in other words, I know from my own enlightenment experience that when you get this enlightenment flash, you're given what's known as your universal face. It's a view yeah. of it, yeah. okay? And you can think of seeing your universal face as, as sort of a weird image of yourself on a sphere and there's a line of spheres going off infinitely that way and infinitely that way. And it's this big giant cube. So no matter where you look, you see your face on these spheres in yep. space. In between, yeah. right? yep. only, only your face is different and it's not quite the same. And you see you have different mm -hmm. scars, different hair patterns, all, but you know it's you. Yeah. And it's this weird kind of a thing. And so you see your universal face and you know a couple of things. You live many times. Yeah. That, that your your soul makes you look, I'll be looking like this in my next life. I'm going to be an old bald guy in my next life at age 17, just like it was this, this life. So, <laughs> so you, it impresses you over and over and over again. And so you take this with you. And so Obama probably was that son of a bitch from, yeah. from Egypt, right? Yeah. At that time. And, you, and your existence, your, the space of time between the existences within this, the materium where we are now, where matter exists, might be thousands of years. Yeah. But these guys, the subcontractor outfit was tasked with finding instances of people that looked like themselves yeah. in a previous life that was his recorded historically. And there's, there's nuances in it that I discussed with Colonel Mars, right? And one of the thing, one of the nuances is, of course, if you're an ancient historical um, person and you're serious about it and you've got power, you have your image recorded for your next incarnation to show yourself that you existed because you know that this will occur at some point that in your next incarnation, you'll be able to look backwards, so to speak, and see what's going on and get that flash and recover this level yeah. of knowledge to be able to actively use it in this life and hopefully be able to do this over and over and over again, which is part of this entire control program that they're trying to do since we've been into this yep. period of time. And they're trying to augment it with machinery now, including CERN, because they don't quite grasp what's going on. They think time is malleable and you can actually take somebody and shove them through time. Okay. So that, that kind of stuff doesn't happen. Uh, you can't do that. I can explain why I don't think that's the case. I can explain why I think Bajiago is a great guy and he was the first person ever to come to the conclusion that there was life on Mars based on these photographs and he's one smart mm -hmm. son of a bitch. Mm -hmm. 
he's a lawyer and so that kind of irritates people yeah. <laughs> that, that aside yeah. irritates that is, me right yeah right and but he believes it okay yeah. he's 100 percent facts he's 100 percent uh truthful yes i don't yes. Ex i don't accept the facts because of how i think about energy i so agree. don't know what happened to him but he mm -hmm. believes what yep. what he's saying that's exactly what i think yeah well okay. we have theories about why he believes that and why it's believable and why he's truthful in spite of the fact mm -hmm. that it does not fit in to our theories about the actual mechanics of the whole thing. Correct. And that goes and into we also see about it goes into simulations and mind control programs yep. and all of the things that we bounce around all the time because quite frankly, we want to know about this shit too because we kind of <laughs> are bumped up against it ourselves. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. You get an hour and a half of missing time and you say, what the hell is going <laughs> yeah. on here? You've got a hell of a lot more than that. A lot more than an hour and a half. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, no, no, but, but see, I mean, it but, just, yeah. just awareness that you've lost time. Exactly. Yeah. If you're a yogi, one of the things you do is you, mm -hmm. and especially if you've gone through the, um, uh, psychedelic immersions that I have, then you get to understand what you are at a level that is yes. very difficult for people to uh, trick. Uh, I, I admit to being susceptible to passive aggressive language because it usually passes over me. I just take everybody at face value. And then later on, it's like, oh no, you were a nasty son of a bitch. And I go back and address it then just to get it out of my system. You know, just because you put it into my system, I'm going to give it back to you. And mm -hmm. I don't care about your convenience that, it, you know, my giving you your passive aggressive stuff back again. But uh, so Jimmy Church, he's a passive aggressive bastard and I've got issues with him, right? Exactly, he's the enforcer. Yeah. He's the, he's yeah. the, the sergeant at arms. And he's of course the guy his that, last name is Church. Exactly. Yeah. I was just going to say, he's the guy at the tent door that, yeah. that brings in the shills, that sends them down to get mm -hmm. healed, you yeah. know, that kind of thing. And so, and he's the social enforcer. Now, uh, the kind of person I am, I resent social enforcement. I hate it and I, I'm not going to take it. That's why I'm a martial artist because I have the ability as a martial artist to not have to take it and to recognize it. Mm -hmm. And so Jimmy Church and his unity in the community, boy, <laughs> set that spine going right off, you know? It's like, oh, yeah. Jimmy, let's do some talking here, boy. <laughs> yeah. you know, this is no good. You can't be doing that stuff. And in fact, it re I really resent it because it's just the same kind of stuff you see with these antifath. The, yep. um, yeah. you know, it's like, you're, you're not allowed to say anything, right? Yep. You're a racist white guy, so you can't say anything. Your words are not, not pertinent. And so uh, it's the same same tactic, and it's the social um, uh, control cohesion it's stuff that really irritates the hell out of me. The constraint exactly. of language that, yeah, minimizing the amount of words you can say, therefore the experiences you can have, and yes, absolutely. And I want it to be the other way. Right? Yeah. I want, to, I want everybody to be Expansive. able to say. Exactly. And so, so I, can say, I can sit here and say that Bajiago, you know, I'll sit down with him and chat all the time, and I'll tell him to his face, guy, I can't accept this, and here's why but I don't think you're lying. I yeah. just think, you know, and, but on the other hand, I'll sit down and I'll tell Corey, Gould, you man, you're, you're deep into some damn lies here, dude. You got to get out before this ends badly. You know, we just had an instance of that. I mean, you know, Sean David Morton, you know, you know about this Sean guy, David right? Morton was actually broadcasting live from his car while he's out. A fugitive. Um, well, a fugitive, well, a fugitive. Yeah, this yeah. afternoon, which yeah. is what, ha today. What, happened with, I, what happened with Sean David Morton? I didn't even, what I, uh, he was convicted. Uh, he's looking at 350 years in prison. For no, it was, it was 87. It was 87, it was 87 months. 87 years. Uh, wasn't, okay. that, wasn't, that, wasn't this the same thing as a few years ago they were talking about this with him? I feel like I've heard. Uh, yeah, but see, there's the there's a thing. He's been doing this pattern of serial sure. uh, fraud for years yeah. and getting mm -hmm. away with it. Never had it, you know, brought up. Then it then it got brought up with the SEC. He couldn't get out of it. They slapped him with an eleven million dollar fine. He tried to finagle his way out of a bankruptcy. With a bankruptcy, the judge says, "No, you can't declare bankruptcy. You've been hauling cash out of the bank like mad in in sacks." You know, we know you've got hidden assets. And so they dis disregarded that. And so he tried to pull a scam on the IRS in order to get the money to pay off the SEC. So, you know, it's this pattern stuff, right? Yeah. And this is, you bring up the Amy Simple McPherson thing. And that's what really has me scared because, you know, I don't want to yeah. see, I don't want to sit here. It really bugged me. I mean, it really annoyed me that Sean uh, was criminal. Okay. And it really annoyed me that he wasn't a stand up guy to just stay, you know, if, he shouldn't have gotten his wife involved, blah, blah, blah. And he should have just, in my opinion, you know, dealt with his pattern now rather than perpetuated into his next life. That's yeah. just my feeling. Right? Yeah. Okay. So, um, uh, but I'm saddened. I'm emotionally racked on this because I like the energy that is Sean David Morton. Okay. All of his lies, all of his bullshit, all of that. I like mm -hmm. the guy. There's mm -hmm. an emotional response in me to something in him. Now, I don't have that with Corey Good, but I don't want to see Corey Good go down this path because he's going to end up dead. He's going yeah. to be the sacrificial you lamb just, in well, this thing. Yeah. You just, 
Yep. Uh, the work you just, the uh, you know, that, that, that's been the underlying concern and it's the kind of thing that I've tried to avoid saying explicitly. But in Why? Why? In the Why? Background, Get out there and say because, it. <laughs> because quite honestly, there is a pattern out there that's occurred over of the last eight years where we've seen this. It's not lost on me that last year at this time, we lost, we lost another guy who was prominent in the community, Max Spears. Max Spears was taken out. Max Spears was taken out as a means to rotate in the next guy. And that pattern has repeated before in this, in this media arena. And I don't this want, is, and I have said though. this, this is different. Yeah, because they've got him, uh, you know, they've got this, this is a much bigger the Jesus game. role. Yeah. yeah. This is a much bigger game. Yeah. yeah. Big, yeah, big money was... involved. And there's some, um, uh, I love words, right? And I got a lot of friends that give me words and I like these guys. They're Irish, you know, all over the planet. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Sanskrit fellows, you know, these kind of guys. But the Irish have got some really interesting words, you know, coming from the Celts. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they've got this saying, Chir Nasa, okay? It means land of the free. And if you actually look at it, tear, terra, earth, na, no, sar, S-A-R, reptile, okay? Yeah. Ireland was the land of the free. Its name is tear nasar in their, in their original language. And it meant we've kicked out the lizards. Reptile, right? yeah. Right. Well, now, now what do we have? Okay. We have the ages pass. What were the ages that we passed through? The age we passed through prior to the current age of Pisces was the age of the ram, right? Okay, the, the age of the, the lizard came before the age of the ram. And now who's our key background player here? Ramsar. Uh, yeah, um, wow, yeah. Goat, goat lizard. The yeah. Goat lizard. Oh, yeah. so he's the goat yeah. lizard in this play, right? Very interesting. Very and good. And of course, what's, what's, he, what's he do? He decorates his body. Uh, the Bahomet, you know, the goat, yeah. the, with the, that was a tattooed being, okay? It was the, one of the first representations of the gods outside of the Sanskrit, outside of the Aran cultures. It was one of the first representations of the gods with tattoos. And so here we are again with Ramsar, and you got the space aliens with the Bahomet hand yeah, gestures. Very good. All, of this, all the symbology. Very you know? good. And Ramsar. So I like the language, right? I love these yep. Irish guys, you know, cut to the quick there. And it's like, oh, yeah, you know, something's going on there. And we name ourselves for our roles on this planet. Yes. All right. I'm so is Ramsar just the, because it's an accident? <laughs> is Ramsar the Judas goat here? Is... No, see, there's the thing. I don't think so. Uh, because of the nature of what's going on and uh, uh, the way this thing is structured, I think that's a very powerful player. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, I think that powerful player may not recognize his own role and may end up being uh, uh, cast in a, um, a depreciating role, but I don't think that that person is going to end up being sacrificial. I think there's power in that individual. Okay. Yeah, well. Yeah. So there, yeah, there's somebody, sobering. I mean, I'd go on up and I'd kick Corey good in the ass, right? And I'd say to you, say to him, you know, this is assault. And if you want to haul me into to court, that'd be fine. You know, well, let's go and deal with it. Uh, but Ramsar, I wouldn't do that. Okay. Mm. Uh, if you, if you contend with that being only one of you is going to come out. Wow. Interesting. Wow. Well, we leave that to you, the viewer to chew on and yeah. that warning sits out there to all involved that you are playing with strange fire. So yeah, very interesting dynamics. We're, we're kind of winding the corner here on the show and I want to give everybody, you know, the opportunity to, to kind of air any last, last words, last thoughts, last concepts. Um, Emily, did you have anything else you wanted to cover? No, I just wanted to tell Cliff, um, thank you all. I appreciate all your yeah. work. Um, all the information you put out that help us to understand what's going on and where we're at. I love all of that. But the thing I love most about you is the spirit with which you do this. You're not looking to somebody for, you're not looking for saviors or someone else to provide the answers. You see a problem and you find creative and interesting ways to try and seek the solution for them. And then you share those methods with all of us. And I, I love your energy and your spirit. And thank you so much for all you do for our you know, community. Sure, sure. <laughs> we yeah. well, thank you much. I think you guys are just great there. too, you yeah. know. Yes. Uh, when, when I'm sitting here programming or, or writing code and stuff, I don't watch. I put in the headphones and listen. 
and you know, like I say, this, the work you do with Bajiago and, and these other individuals, uh, uh, really top notch, you know, and I love the, the uh, kick ass uh, CJ Chanter stuff, right? Mm. Uh, so, you know, mm. get into yeah. some deep thinking there. <clears throat> these yeah. are individuals yeah. that you bring on that actually do think, and uh, it's uh, kind of rare. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's, what we, that's what we aspire to do. We want people to think, we want them to feel, and uh, we want them to extend themselves because I think that's the only way humans prosper is when they push themselves to the limits. Ah, so folks, you can find you, to tell people where they can find you, tell, tell them about the reports. Um, well, I've, I've had to slip into just doing cryptocurrency reports recently because okay. I want to help as many people as I can during this particular time, right? I'm very time sensitive, very temporal like you. It's a time when we're making a transition. The, the actual uh, global reset is here. The monetary reset is here. It's not Nasara. It's none of that crap. It's cryptocurrencies. <laughs> we can get into it now. People will make great fortunes with no great crimes. And so I'm only doing cryptocurrencies during the next few months. It also relates to the fact that I've got to tune the lexicon because of Corey Good and his bullshit. And I ended up with a wrist injury due to my dogs and running into some uh, a herd of deer over at Evergreen, uh, Evergreen State College. I was walking the dogs over there. We came on, on this herd of deer. Suddenly, the dogs oh. were both on one arm. They've got eight legs and 200 Oof. pounds. A and... lot, lot of weird stuff going on at Evergreen College these days. <laughs> oh, boy, let me tell you about other it. Other animals. <laughs> yeah, hey, I was told by one of the students or by one of the locals here that students had put up placards, and I saw it, uh, sheets of paper saying that uh, walking your dogs on campus was racist. And then you would be conf you would be confronted, and there was uh, what they say not confiscation, but there was there would be something. And wow. The word I read at the time was like a mugging, and it's like, wow. dude, you come anywhere near me, and I'm gonna tell my dogs to eat your nads. <laughs> right, like, like kick them like a the, the, right? copper sick balls, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, so yeah, it's it's weird over there. The energies, you know, yeah, uh, you know, and it's all concentrating, and and the the weather is weird. We're all suffering, and and it's going to get stranger. We're going to get to the point where we've got to maybe live in caves and stick sticks out. Oh, it's gonna, you know, <laughs> a whole big rigmarole. <laughs> well. All I can say is we discussed a lot, and I thought it was kind of a unique conversation the whole way around. Um, but we certainly didn't cover all the things that I would have loved to have talked about. So we invite you back again oh, at your convenience and ours um, yeah. to, to cover some more ground. Because the crypto thing is going to evolve rapidly, and I suspect some other things like SSP and the breakaway civilization in Antarctica are going to get interestinger and interestinger <laughs> as time goes by here. So... Thank you so much, Cliff High, for coming on. And uh, thank all of you out there for uh, tuning in to the channel, OffPlanetRadio.com. I'm Randy Moggins with Emily Moyer and our very special guest, Cliff High. The truth is out there. It's inside you. Now go find it.